They are a mystery to many. Countless brands have tried to pitch their products, but only a few have prevailed. Now, for the first time, we will interact firsthand with these mystifying gatekeepers. Today, we bring you Behind the Buyer's Desk. Cool. Hey, everybody. Welcome to this week's episode of Behind the Buyer's Desk. We are here with Wade Yenny from Jimbo's Naturally. Uh, super excited to have him on the show this week. Wade, thanks so much for being with us. Thanks for having me. It's good to be here. So I want to dive right into your background. If you can kind of give a little bit of information on just kind of where your previous stops were and what kind of led you to this now newly promoted role of Director of Grocery at Jimbo's. Yeah, sure. So uh, actually, the first half of my career, uh, I was in the restaurant business um, and kind of found my way into the grocery business uh, through uh, Bueller's in Ohio, a 13 store chain, went to work with them uh, in the restaurants and quickly realized that if I wanted to get anywhere in the grocery business, uh, I couldn't be a restaurant manager in a grocery store. I had to be a grocery manager and so on. So I uh, spent uh, 20 years with that company. The last, uh, the last few is senior director of center store. Uh, conventional markets, 13 stores throughout North Central Ohio, um, great company, uh, big presence in natural foods, uh, really kind of focused on healthy, healthy living and doing things, uh, you know, kind of above and beyond normal conventional. Uh, and then I made it to Louisiana with the Rouse's group uh, in early 2019, uh, went there as a category manager and quickly moved up to director of non-food specialty or non-foods, candy, health and beauty and general merchandise, uh, spent a year and a half with them. They have 64 stores, maybe 65 now, uh, along the Gulf coast, Louisiana, Alabama, Mississippi, uh, kind of same thing, family owned, uh, third generation running the company, uh, again, highly focused in the conventional side with, uh, natural, specialty, organic, uh, just really focused on those areas in their stores. Uh, and then arrived here at Jimbo's in July of last year as the grocery buyer, and uh, timing, uh, timing is everything, Cameron. I, this week, I uh, was promoted to director of grocery. So I've um, been here just uh, just over nine months now and uh, happy to be here. Loving the weather. So you made that transition really kind of like in the thick of, of the pandemic and everything. So how was how was that transition from from Rouse's to Jimbo's and, and kind of, um, you know, what was um, really the shift that you saw kind of in consumer purchasing and just kind of handling the day to day at the retail stores? um, kind of po during COVID. Yeah. So the transition itself, obviously kind of interesting, uh, moving, moving halfway across the country in the middle of the pandemic, uh, had its own challenges. Um, but it transitioned pretty well, actually, uh, got here, like I said, in July. Um, I can't recall at that time what tier we were in, but, uh, you know, things sh still shut down. I think, uh, for the most part, we were through the worst of it here, you know, in, in California. Um, you, you know, the beginning, uh, there was a lot of things going on with, you know, closures and, and purchases and things like that. Prior to me getting here, I think my experience in Louisiana was a little bit different in that regard. I think, um, you know, I was on the non-food side. So sanitizer was crazy. Uh, you know, that was a big part of what I was doing on a daily basis is trying to source sanitizer and, and get that out here. And I missed that surge here in, in California. Uh, so when I got here, um, really, it was kind of trying to replenish the stores, trying to get back, you know, uh, that that initial rush where people were buying anything that was on the shelf. And, um, you know, it, it didn't matter what the brand was. It was just they're grabbing what was there. I missed that here. Um, and so really it was trying to get back to, OK, here's what we used to carry. Uh, here's what we filled in the gaps with. And OK, let's get back to where we were and try and get back to some planogram integrity and, and so forth. Were you reviewing both at Rouse's and Jimbo's, I guess, were you reviewing new products during the pandemic or was it really like, hey, we need to just keep the products on the shelf that we have right now and let's talk kind of down the road? Sure, sure. So at Rouse's, uh, I can say that we really, it was more a, a matter, like I said, I, I was prioritizing a, a, on the non-food side there and conventional, we were trying to get sanitizer, we were trying to get paper towels, we were trying to get uh dish soap, hand soap, uh, toilet paper. I mean, it was just on a daily basis. It was really scrambling to try and keep our shelves full of, of those categories. Um, here, when I got here, kind of the same thing, trying to get back to where we were. And so uh, during my initial, you know, first month, six weeks or so, it was like prioritizing new items just wasn't there. It was like, you know, just check back with me. I've got to get my feet on the ground here, figure this place out 
figure our processes out. Um, so a little bit of it was pandemic related. A little bit of it was my own personal trying to get acclimated to my new new area, new categories, and and everything like that. And have you seen that kind of turn around since the beginning of the new year? Is is reviews starting to open up and it's starting to be like, okay, let's start to plan kind of what the retail is going to look absolutely. like? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So one of the things I initiated uh, in, in this calendar year was I was creating a calendar review schedule. So like uh, grocery at Jimbo's covers grocery, dairy, frozen bulk foods, fresh juice, bakery or uh, bread. And uh, so I created a calendar for the what we would call the grocery side, dry grocery, taxable grocery and the perishable side of the grocery side, which would be dairy, juice, frozen, bulk. Uh, and those categories created created a calendar. Um, so each month we look at certain categories within each side of the business and accept submissions for new items. Um, look at the current current product selection that we have. What are we carrying? How's the category performing? Um, how's sales units over last year? Um, and then kind of look at the submissions we get, evaluate our mix, and then and then look at implementing the new items and planograms. Awesome. And, and you're kind of like in the natural specialty store kind of Mecca area of the country, right? You've got the Lazy Acres, you've got the Lassens, you obviously got my Erewhon. Um, what kind of differentiates Jimbo's for, from the rest in that area? And when is kind of, what's your sweet spot in terms of kind of new and emerging brands that you're looking for? So I would say what differentiates us probably more so than anything is we have some pretty high standards and I know everybody kind of works, you know, in this channel, they do their own thing um, and have their own standards on their end, but our end uh, from everything that I gather is probably more strict than anyone else that I've, I've seen. Um, and those are posted on our website. So I think uh, first and foremost, that's kind of what gears us, you know, it, uh, we can't look at anything that doesn't meet those product standards. And at the end of the day, uh, Jimbo himself actually signs off on every new item we bring into our stores. Um, and so that really sets us apart because, um, you know, I, I try not to even talk to him about something that I don't think has a chance, you know, unless I, right. I feel really, really passionate about it and, and want to roll up my sleeves and get to work on something. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the ingredient standards posted on our website, uh, it's funny because as I talk to brokers or vendors, uh, I say, have you, have you looked at the, have you looked at the standards? And, you know, the answer is always yes. And then I'll get a box full of something in the first ingredient and it's something that disqualifies it from bringing it in our stores. So it's, it's really, um, it's a everyday process to look at, okay, does this item meet our standards? Okay. What are the next steps from there? Yeah. It's kind of like, don't miss the layups, right? Like if you've got a product where you already know it's going to DQ you from actually being, um, you know, under review for them, don't go and present, like just kind of like if they make the uh, information actually available, like that's definitely something you have to take advantage of as the brand. Um, exactly. so kind of uh, what stage are though brands kind of looking to get into Jimbo's? Is it kind of like they're in less than a hundred stores or just, they feel like Jimbo's is a perfect fit. What, what kind of emerging brands are you seeing really coming to you on a daily basis? So I think um, people look at Jimbo's, uh, you know, you mentioned Air One. I think people look at Jimbo's as another kind of cornerstone of this market as far as uh, the natural channel. Um, it's a great feather to have in your cap, if you will, um, to say, you know, I, I'm in a Jimbo's because I think it, it that the name resonates in the community um, from a standards perspective, as well as uh, with our main suppliers, UNFI and Kahi, right? Um, it, they know if if a, a vendor goes to them and says, hey, I'm, I'm going to be in Jimbo's, that's, that's one of the, the things they need to get more distribution throughout the natural community, um, along with some of the other uh, vent stores you mentioned, the other retailers. There's so many great ones in SoCal that um, I think uh, Jimbo's is just one of the premier ones that as, as a brand comes um, to, to the table, they say, hey, I, I've got Jimbo's on board, then it's really speaks volumes. Um, and I think, uh, you know, we, we've seen a lot of emerging brands come, come through. Um, and more often than not, it's Air one, and then right behind, there we are. You know, it's it's that's just what we hear. And if I'm if I'm a brand and I'm already in K here UNFI, but I'm not in your DC, is Jimbo's going to be enough to turn me on in that DC? I I don't know if it will be solely enough, but it it'll put it put you in the right direction. I think uh, sometimes they look for maybe one other. You know, we have four stores, so right. um, a lot of times that's not four stores by itself is not enough to to get where you want to go. 
But um, I can say that uh, from my short experience here that a lot of times um, we can push that needle over the edge if, if we need to, um, just, just depending on what the brand is, what the category is, and what our expected movement is, you know, um, it just, it's really dependent. Yeah, it's also probably a good partnership ship with other retailers in the area and also like under independents and small chains that are going to help you open up that full DC. I think saying, hey, listen, we already got commitment from Jimbo's. You can probably go round out the rest of the commitment from that DC, from that area just from that commitment alone. Um, so let's say if I'm a brand, I'm coming to you and I'm pitching you, what is the good that you see from brands pitching right now? And what is the bad that you see kind of continuously come up where you're like, man, I wish a brand didn't do that, but you see it repeatedly kind of happen over and over in pitches when they finally get to you to present. Sure. So I think uh, the, the best thing for me personally is just what we're doing is just to have a conversation, right? You tell me, tell me your story. Who are you? What are you trying to do? Where are you trying to go? Um, what are you trying to be? Um, I'm, I'm, I won't say old school. I came up old school, right? Where it was buyers and, and as a buyer, I was just going to beat you until you gave me exactly what I needed from a cost and slotting and everything. And, and I'm slowly transitioning and I'd say I'm almost fully new school now where, Hey, I've come to realize, hey, these are, it's all about relationships, right? It's all about what can we do together to drive your product forward? So uh, I won't say it's a pet peeve, but I'm not a big fan of, of uh, PowerPoint presentations, um, you know, uh, and I, I don't need to be read to, you know, as far as, you know, hey, this is, this is, you know, this slide, that slide, I, I don't need that. I'd rather just talk and, and let's, let's talk about, again, who you are, what you're trying to do with your brand. How does it fit in with what we have in store? Um, and I, I think the other pet peeve mentioning our ingredient standards, if you don't know, making the presentation to me, who we are at Jimbo's and what we're trying to do, um, you know, and come, come to me with a product that obviously either doesn't meet our standards or isn't a good fit for who we are. Um, that's, that's definitely a bad mark, right? I mean, you know, if you're a brand and you have several categories and um, maybe one category isn't a fit, but the other one is. Don't try and sell me the whole the whole kit and caboodle, right? Focus on what's a good fit for who we are, and let's work together to to achieve success. Yeah, I love the bit about the PowerPoint because it's like it's also in this industry you're doing something so fun and so communal as like sharing food together, right? Or breaking bread and like having a conversation. Hopefully, you know, when we get away from Zoom pitches and it's becoming more in a room where you're getting to sample the product, like it does have that communal aspect of it, like trying to bring back people to your pitch, I feel like, and making sure you're checking off the boxes. Like, oh, I wanted to go into the meeting, making sure I hit these marks. It comes off that way to the buyer and it doesn't come off naturally. Right. right. Um, so, yeah, sorry. No, I was going to say exactly. I think I think you're dead on. And the one thing I'll say about uh, Zoom Zoom meetings, um, for me, it's it's been nice. I, in fact, that's what I do every Friday. I mean, virtually my entire day is devoted to meeting with vendors and brokers. And it's allowed me you know, I can, I can slam eight to 10 appointments in a, in a day. Um, there's no travel time. There's no, you know, there's no worry about lunch or anything like that. It's, you know, Hey, let's, let's talk, let's, let's see what we can do. And, and um, although I miss the face to face, um, it's also open new opportunities that, Hey, you know, this, this morning, maybe I'm talking to somebody from three different time zones and we can do that in this format. Whereas, you know, with travel time and hotels and air, airplanes and everything else to, to have an online meeting, it's, it's kind of a blessing. And if the pandemic and, and COVID has taught me nothing else, it's like, hey, use the tools that you have in front of you to, to keep doing what you need to do. Yeah, 100%. I couldn't agree more. And I think, too, it's it's probably fast track some brands like, into more retail distribution than they actually thought they were going to get into. Um, you, you mentioned brokers a few times, and, and it's something we actually haven't touched on um, through this series. We touch on a lot of in our podcast and different stuff. But for as a retail buyer, what's your perspective on brokers? And, and sometimes I'm sure a broker comes to you that maybe not is the best fit for that for that brand. But what should brands look out for when they're picking a retail partner from the buyer standpoint of like, Hey, this is a, this is what makes a great broker. And this is the brokers I say yes to when they come and represent a brand versus the ones where it's like, this is probably not a fit. Um, I like the brand, but the broker might not make sense for this. Right. So I think, um, you know, so many times in the, uh, in the broker community um, with brands, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. And I think if you're a brand, um, you have to focus on, on how big that broker is and what specifically they're going to do for you. Um, and, and again, I, I'll say this time and time again, this business is all about relationships, right? And so um, learn if you're a brand and you're talking to a broker, find out 
how that broker represents themselves and the brands that they represent, right? And and what kind of relationships they have. Um, I can say that there's no one that's you know it's Joe Broker and I'm automatically going to put his product on the shelf. I mean, it, there's that just doesn't exist. I mean, um, I mentioned the category review schedule that we do. Um, and I've sent that out to our broker community and, you know, uh, I'll tell them the same thing. If there's a home run in your portfolio and we're not reviewing that category until November, don't wait until November, bring it to me now. Right. But know that not every item is a home run so that if you're the broker and you're coming out of schedule for a category um, and you say, Hey, this is a home run and it's a dud. Well, that kind of speaks to your, you know, my respect of you and, and, moving forward, I'm not going to take your word for it necessarily, right? So going back to the broker piece, if I'm a brand, um, I think especially small brands and, and local brands um, have to really think about that broker piece from how big the broker is and what they can do for them um, outside of what they can do for themselves, you know, again, because uh, that person is going to be representing you and, and your company. And you really have to make sure that fit is there. And you know, not one size fits all. Yeah. I think uh, we see that oftentimes. We also say like time, like the broker's job doesn't end once they get the yes, right? Like making sure that you're also facilitating paperwork. And then once the product gets on the shelf, okay, now the hard work starts, right? And so understanding having a broker partner who actually has seen really good velocity and reorders and, and making sure that you've got a broker partner who's going to be there for that third, fourth, fifth order, not just like getting your product in. Um, and then also the biggest thing for our brand partners is realizing like, even though you have a broker, it doesn't mean you can't be part of the sales process anymore, right? It's just like, they're supposed to amplify your voice. And a lot of times we see people who are like, yeah, I onboarded a broker and they haven't done anything for the last six months. Like what's going on? It's like, they're, they're just, they're essentially an entity of your sales team. Like you still have to stay on them, stay a part of that whole process. And, and those are the biggest things that we see kind of come through. So it's interesting to see that that's also resonated on the buyer side as well. Yeah, I think what you hit one of the biggest points for me is, is I would almost say that getting it on the shelf is the easy part. And, and getting it off the shelf is the hard part. And so, yeah, once your foot is in the door, you know, you, you kind of take this deep, deep breath and say, oh, wow, I'm in Jimbo's now. I'm, I'm good. That's just getting it on the shelf. I mean, if we don't see it go out the front door, um, you know, going back to Louisiana, uh, our president there said one of the things that, that really still resonates with me um, until the scanner beeps. Right. I mean, it's not sold until it goes, you know, until it goes out. You sold it in the back door, but that's that first order, you know, and, and what about that second order and third order and fourth order? And uh, whether it's the broker, whether it's the brand, it's a continual process to to make it make sure that scanner beeps. Right. And, and also one of the other things that I always say is um, I'm just here to sell more stuff. And that's all we want to do. Right. I mean, whether you're a brand, whether you're the retailer, whether you're a broker, we all get paid the same way by selling more stuff. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And, and we, so we touched on velocity and kind of moving through, like what is a strong or kind of standard promotional schedule for my brand look like or promotional strategy look like from a brand? Like what am I going in knowing that I need to kind of offer or come with um, to make sure that I'm successful in Jimbo's once the product hits the shelf? So I believe pretty firmly that um, when a brand gets in the store, um, we need to establish a price point, um, an initial price point. Uh, you know, so many times I think brands want to come in and, you know, we want to be BOGO. We want to be 25% off. We want to go in at, you know, $5.99 when our everyday retail is supposed to be $8.99. I want to establish that $8.99 retail and, and make sure that I can sell the product at the retail that I establish. I mean, it's great if somebody comes in and buys it at $5.99, but if it collects dust at $8.99, you're going to lose money on the brand side by always having to have it on promotion, right? So uh, once once that promotion uh, or the, uh, the retail is established, that everyday retail, um, I like to see promotions at least once a quarter, um, you know, some kind of promotion. Uh, we have different vehicles, uh, whether they're display pieces, we have a newsletter, we have side stacks, we do many different things, um, but some kind of activity once a quarter to show that, you know, uh, the, brand, the brand supports who they are and also supports our, our different, uh, programming that we do. And, uh, that's really the best, the best thing for me. Awesome. Wait, well, I think, I think we touched on a lot of great points. Um, I think a lot of stuff we haven't covered in the last few episodes, I think, um, as a brand, I, what I would most want to know is if I was interested in pitching Jimbo's kind of what's the process, how would we touch base? What's that look like? Just a starting point. Um, if I'm just listening to this, what's the best way to get in touch with Jimbo's or yourself and, and kind of go through that process and get it started. 
So today, now, um, the best way is to reach out to me directly, um, preferably through email at, uh, at, at Jimbo's. And it's, it's simply my name, Wade Yenny at Jimbo's.com. Um, and then typically, I'm going to respond back with our review calendar to kind of show you where we're at, um, you know, as far as what month we're looking to each category. Um, we are currently revamping our uh, online tool, you know, so if you go to the website now, um, you can send in a generic, uh, you know, a new vendor type thing. Um, and, uh, but like I said, we're revamping that. So my, my vision is that we're going to get that, that category review calendar posted so that if you're a brand and you go to Jimbo's website, you're going to see, okay, it's, it's April. They're looking at this category, it, um, my category, my item, they're going to be looking at in two months. And to kind of give you a, a better idea of what we look at and when we look at it, um, you can also reach me on LinkedIn. I, you know, I, I typically, if someone reaches me there, you know, and connects with me um, and then ask me, I'm going to say, Hey, shoot me something over at Jimbo's so it doesn't get lost in a LinkedIn tunnel. Right. So, um, but that's, that's the best way. Just reach out to me and uh, see what we can do. I think I speak on behalf of all brands. When I say thank you for planning on making your category review schedule public, it's like awful when you're trying to get into a retailer and it's like, okay, well, I can got to find the category review schedule and it's nowhere to be found. And it's like so hard and difficult just to figure out, okay, when at least should I make my sales efforts? So I know brands are definitely appreciative of that. Um, Wait, thank you again so much. I think this is a ton of valuable information. I'm sure you'll have a lot of brands reaching out to you and hopefully they come equipped with everything uh, that you've kind of outlined for them today. And and thank you so much for uh, imparting this wisdom today. I appreciate it. Sure. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. And like I said, the first step is make sure you look at that webpage and look at the product standards, you know, um, make sure it's a fit. Absolutely. Thank you so much.